In this video, I will be going through a tutorial for the 3D Molecular Models Lab. I will be walking you through how to draw the Lewis dot diagrams for each of the compounds. I will explain how to fill in each of the columns on the data table, and I will walk you through the entire row for the first two compounds. I will not be answering any of the post-lab questions for you, but I will give some hints on three that I think you may have trouble with. Our first compound is CCl4, which is carbon tetrachloride. Our carbon atom is going to have four valence electrons around it, and we have four chlorines that are going to want to bond to those electrons. I'm going to bond one of those chlorines on each of the sides, sharing electrons in the middle because these are all covalent molecular compounds. So this is what your Lewis dot diagram should look like. Uh, you could also draw yours with the lines, which represent a bond. Remember, each one of these lines is the same thing as uh, two dots which are being circled. And now for filling in this row on the data table, your total number of electron groups around the central atom is a combination of your bonding directions and your number of lone pairs. So it might actually be easier to save this one for last. For a number of bonding directions here, we clearly have four bonding directions going around the carbon because of the four chlorines. So we'll fill that in as four. Lone pairs. They only matter if they're on the central atom for the shape. And carbon doesn't have any lone pairs. They're only lone pairs on the chlorine. So that's going to be zero. Now this first column should be the sum of these two. So four bonding directions and two electron or sorry, zero lone pairs on the central atom means that you have a total of four electron groups on the carbon. All right, now for the bond angle, what you would do from here is you would build this within the FET simulation program. You're going to have your four bonds with no lone pairs on it, and then what you need to do is click on these options right here, show bond angles, electron geometry, and molecular geometry, and then all that information will be filled in for you. So here we have a bond angle of 109.5, we have a tetrahedral electron geometry, which is shown right here, and we have a tetrahedral molecular geometry. All right, for polar or nonpolar bonds, this is based on which atoms are connecting to each other. So in this instance, we have carbon connecting to chlorine. There are only two instances where you're going to have nonpolar bonds. So nonpolar bonds can occur when you have a diatomic element. That means that you have two of literally the same atom bonding to each other. An, an example of that would be something like nitrogen bonding to nitrogen, which is not the case here. Another example of a nonpolar interaction would be carbon bonding to hydrogen. The electronegativity is so similar between carbon and hydrogen, we can basically say that they have the same desire for electrons. So that's going to lead to a nonpolar bond, which means the electrons are right in the middle. But since carbon and chlorine doesn't fit that criteria, these electrons are going to be closer to one atom as opposed to the other. And in this instance, because chlorine is more electronegative, that's going to be the side the electrons are pulled to. Uh, that's from our unit 5 uh, on periodic trends. So right here, we're going to fill in polar. And now for determining whether it's a polar or nonpolar molecule. For this one, you really want to look at the three-dimensional structure that you built within the program. If the compound has polar bonds, it could also be a polar molecule. But you have to look for symmetry. If the molecule is symmetrical, then any of the polarity that it had is going to be canceled out. And that's what's happening here. So I have this bond pulling straight up, and I have three pulling down at an angle. Well, the angle between these three is going to cancel out to give a net pull going straight down, which cancels out the net pull going up. So this is going to be a nonpolar molecule, even though it has polar bonds. Now, something else that's important to think about, uh, within this program, they don't show you what each of these little balls actually represents. The fact that all of these are actually the same atom, chlorine, is important. If one of these was different, let's say that it was a fluorine, or maybe a hydrogen, then even though geometrically it would still be symmetrical, it would no longer be symmetrical in terms of molecular uh, interactions because the hydrogen would not have the same pull as the chlorine. 
Now, in addition to filling things out based on the program, you could also use that sheet that I gave you from class. So the way that you would use this, you know that there were four total electron groups, so we're within this category. That means it's part of the tetrahedral family or the tetrahedral electron geometry. Now I go across, okay, bond angles of 109.5 for all of the members of that family. It does decrease a little bit if we have a lone pair instead of a bond. That was something from our notes, but they're all approximately 109.5. Uh, and then in this example, we have 4 and 0. So that means the molecular name is also tetrahedral. On this sheet, it says geometry name. It means molecular geometry. You could also see a, a version of the three-dimensional shape here, which should help you in order to determine the polarity. So there were uh, two pages for this. Uh, there's one through or two through four, and then here we have five and six. So there was this slide within the notes, so you could get that from the video. There is a PDF that I also posted on Classroom if you no longer have your paper copy. For our next example, we have pH3. Our phosphorus is going to have five valence electrons around it because it's in group 15 or 5A. There are three hydrogens which are going to connect to each of those sides which have a lone electron. Remember, when you're filling in these dot diagrams, you want to have your electrons spread out before doubling up, because otherwise if you had two, two, and then one with an empty space, you might have a hard time trying to figure out where things are actually going to fit on the phosphorus. All right, so filling in the rest of this row, number of bonding directions on central atom, we have three hydrogens. There's one lone pair, so that's a total of four electron groups. You can see from here we have that bond angle that is still about 109.5. You could also get it from the sheet from the previous slide. Electron geometry is going to be tetrahedral. Now this part is important. Notice that down here, sorry, I spelled that wrong, tetrahedral. All right, so notice on the bottom, the electron geometry is on the right, but up here it is on the left. So make sure that you don't mix up those boxes. Uh, over here, our molecular name is trigonal pyramidal. And now we have to fill in whether it has polar or nonpolar bonds and then polar nonpolar molecule. Phosphorus to hydrogen is going to be a polar bond. It doesn't meet those criteria from the previous example. It's not carbon to hydrogen and it's not a diatomic. And then for the symmetry, this lone pair is not equivalent to any of those bonds. So this is not symmetrical which makes it a polar molecule. All right, for the rest of the examples, I'm not going to be filling in the rest of this. I want you to try to do that on your own, but I will at least show you the Lewis dot diagram, and I do have the examples of what they would look like within the program in case you want to look at the 3D structure for the last column here. So in this example, we have a boron. Boron has three valence electrons. Notice this red star here. I mean, this means that it is an exception to the octet rule. So if you don't end up with eight electrons around your central atom in the end, that's okay. I'm going to put a chlorine on each of those sides. So that is what you should end up with for your Lewis dot diagram. In our next example, we have carbon dioxide. We've drawn this one in class a few times. Uh, I'm going to draw X's around the carbon and dots around the oxygen. So each of the oxygens has six, the carbon has four. I start off with an initial connection between them. Now the only way to make all these atoms follow the octet rule, and it's not an exception, there's no red star here, is to put electrons in the middle in order to make an additional bond. So I'm going to take those two and put them in the center on that side, these two and put them in the center on this side. So if I were to redraw this, I'm going to have oxygen double bonding to carbon on either side, and each oxygen is going to have two lone pairs on it. In our next example, we have H2S. We're going to have a sulfur with six valence electrons around it. Hydrogen is going to come in on bond and bond on these two sides because there's an empty space. And we end up with our H2S. In this example, we have PBR5. Notice that it is an exception to the octet rule. 
I'm going to put phosphorus in the middle with its five valence electrons. And I have five bromines that have to come in and bond. Now it's pretty obvious where the first three are going to go because there's those empty spaces down here. But then normally we only have a maximum of four atoms going around our central atom. Well, that was because we were following the octet rule, so each of those sides, two, four, six, eight. But in this instance, we are going to have a bromine, which is going to attach to this electron, and another bromine that is going to attach to this one. I think I drew one extra electron here, so that one would not belong. Get rid of that. All right, now it might look a little cramped on paper, but remember, this is going to occur within three dimensions, so when you have it actually built, it would look somewhat like this. So phosphorus here is being an exception to the octet rule. Our sulfur hexachloride is also going to be an exception to the octet rule. So I'm going to start with my six valence electrons here. I'm going to have a chlorine on each of these sides, and it's going to connect to each of those six electrons, since each of them need one more in order to follow their octet. So when I give you these exceptions to the octet rule, the exception is always going to be on the central atom. It's not going to be on any of the atoms that are bonding to it, like chlorine in this example. So here we have six atoms which are going to bond to the sulfur, and within three-dimensional space it would end up looking like this. For our next one, we have xenon tetrafluoride. Now xenon is a noble gas. It doesn't typically react, but in this instance, there are four fluorines that are going to come in and try to bond to, to these electrons. I'm going to put one of these fluorines on each of the sides. And you'll notice that when I'm done, there are four dots that did not go into those bonds. Now I'm going to redraw this to make it just a little bit neater. So I'm going to draw my fluorines, and just in the instant, uh, just in the interest of saving time, I'm not going to put the lone pairs around the fluorine, but I'm going to draw those lone electrons together, and maybe draw them a little bit darker so that they stand out. So you can see that this has the four bonds and then the two lone pairs that are left on the xenon. So this is also going to be breaking the octet rule. All right, in this example, I have a carbon atom, which has four valence electrons. I have an oxygen, which has six. And then I have the two hydrogens, which each have one. I'm going to make an initial connection here. Carbon I'm putting in the middle. It has the most bonding opportunities. So it makes the most sense to uh, put that there. Uh, the only way to have this properly follow the octet rule is to have both hydrogens bond to this carbon. And then I could take these two electrons and put them both in the center. So I'm going to make a double bond. In the end, you're going to have carbon double bonding to an oxygen, the hydrogen on either side of the carbon, and then a couple of lone pairs on the oxygen. And you got a 3D structure like here in the bottom right corner. All right, so this is our last example from the data table. We have C2H2. Uh, we also did this in one of the key assignments. So you have a carbon with four valence electrons another carbon with four valence electrons. We'll link those in the middle. And then we have only two electrons, so we could put, or two hydrogens, so we could put one on either side. Now once we've done this, the only way to make it follow the octet rule, because this one is not an exception, there's no red star there, is to put these electrons in the center for a double bond, and then these electrons in the center for a triple bond. So I'll redraw this. We end up with this structure. Now this one is kind of a special case here because you can't actually make this molecule exactly within that 3D program that we have. It only lets you add atoms to this central atom right here, the one in purple. So if I try to add that additional hydrogen, it'll come off over here and you get the wrong shape. So for this one, I'm asking that you just make it like this. So you put a triple bond on one side, a single bond on the other, and then you kind of just have to imagine that there's another bond coming off over here with another one of those hydrogens on this side. So you can see here that this would be symmetrical and one straight line. And that should help you to fill in the rest of this table up here.
All right, so the final thing that I wanted to cover here was uh, some of the post lab questions. I'm not going to actually answer any of them, but I did want to kind of give a couple hints in case you might have trouble with any of them. The first one says to explain why a molecule of CO2 does not have a net dipole even though it has polar bonds. And in class on Friday, I had a few people ask me about this thing right here, net dipole. A net dipole just means that you have a molecule which is polar. You know di means two. So this means that you have two poles on the molecule. Uh, an example of this would be something like water. So we've drawn this plenty of times before. You know that with water on the side with the lone pairs, since oxygen is more electronegative, we say that this end is partially negative, And the hydrogen end would be partially positive. Well, I could say that this molecule has a net dipole. It has a positive and a negative end. Now the carbon dioxide dot diagram we drew before, it looks like this. So you want to think about the structure here and then try to explain why this would not have a positive and a negative end to it or a net dipole. Now for question five, it says, why do NH3, H2O, and HF molecules have hydrogen bonding but CH4 molecules do not. So for this, I just want to remind you that hydrogen bonding does not mean that you have hydrogen bonding inside of a molecule. It's something completely different. It's one of the three types of intermolecular or van der Waals forces that we talked about in the notes. Uh, if you go to the last slide from the last time that we took notes, it basically gives the criteria for when you can and cannot have hydrogen bonding. So if you're not sure when hydrogen bonding would occur, I would suggest that you go back to that. Uh, now for the last one, I'll give you a little more detail on. It says, which intermolecular forces are present in each of the following molecules? First, I'm going to draw the Lewis dot diagrams. So we have a hydrogen, or sorry, a carbon with four hydrogens around it. We have an oxygen with two hydrogens around it. And then we have a carbon with a chlorine and three fluorines. And these, of course, have all of their lone pair electrons around them as well. Now, when you're looking at each of these molecules, you need to try to determine which types of intermolecular forces are present. And remember, there's three. There's the London dispersion. London dispersion forces are present within all molecules. Uh, it's the weakest of the three intermolecular forces but it does increase the more electrons you have within the molecule. Uh, then you have uh, dipole interactions or dipole forces. These are only present in polar molecules. They are where you have a permanent dipole, so a partial positive and a partial negative end. And uh, that permanent dipole helps your molecules to stick together better than they could with uh, London dispersion forces, which again are only temporary. Uh, then you have your hydrogen bonding, which was the strongest. And again, you should look back at your notes to see what criteria, how you're supposed to know if you have hydrogen bonding or not. So essentially what you're supposed to do here is look at each of these molecules, determine which types of forces they are going to have from this list, and then you can rank them based on that. The stronger your intermolecular forces are, uh, the more likely that it is going to have a higher boiling point. And the weaker your intermolecular forces are, the lower the boiling point will be. All right, so that just about covers our tutorial video. Uh, if you have any other questions, please do use the mailbag that I posted to Google Classroom. I will be checking that daily. And uh, if any of your questions seem to be a little too more complex, I may put out more of these uh, tutorial videos based on what you are asking me.